Good morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the past of transportation, a little bit about the present, although all of you probably feel and experience that every day here, uh, and then a little bit about the future and how we can get to that productivity shift in transportation and to reclaim our title of being innovators, not just in computing and internet and online, but actually in transportation as well. And I'll show you in the history, we actually were innovators. We've just forgotten that part. So um, I want to take you back to the time of your great-great-grandparents, because that's when one of these previous revolutions really kicked in, and life and quality of life as we know it today really began. This is a set of inventions that were made over 100 years ago that fundamentally changed how we live, work, um, and get around. You have what was at the time called indoor weather control, which we now know as a thermostat. You have elevators and the ability to go to high-rise buildings combined with steel and the ability to fundamentally have cities that don't burn down every couple of years the way they used to uh, in the 1850s and earlier. You, of course, have electric light. And to tell you a little bit more detail about that, it used to cost two average workers wages for an entire year to pay for one hour of light back when we burned sesame oil for light. Think about that. Two years of work for one hour of light. Now. Each of us can have a little tactical light in our pocket that gives 10,000 times four orders of magnitude more light. And obviously, I don't even worry about the cost of that light per minute or per hour. Uh, we also started building transportation networks. We use steel for bridges and for rails. And just to highlight how dramatic these shifts in productivity enabled by technology are, I want to highlight what happened in this region at that time 130 years ago. Suddenly, we had light, books, and education affordable to the middle class. And we founded some fantastic universities that many of you probably went to. It used to be five months by wagon train to get here into the West, and not everybody made it. Now we take for granted that you can hop on a plane. 100 years ago, you could hop on a train and do it in two days. Occasionally, United still takes two days, but... <laughs> Life expectancy actually doubled. And that's after not changing since Roman times. Think about that. Almost 2,000 years of no change, and then we double in the span of essentially one generation. And we have a 13-fold increase in GDP per capita and 100 times increase in the energy we all can use and have available for us every single day. So that was a dramatic shift. However, if you look at the numbers, that was a shift in labor productivity. Very, very dramatic. We've all benefited from it. Silicon Valley continues to drive this. If you look at labor productivity in our, our high-tech companies, between the robots that Applied Materials uses and the fact that everything else is now online and internet still continues to climb at this pace. But underneath it all, we've substituted energy for labor. So if you look at our resource productivity, energy, water, land, food, we actually have not had a similar inflection point. We have, depending on the resource you look at, just below or just above 1% growth in productivity in those areas. You can see it's given us some benefits over the 150 years but tiny compared to what we've been able to do with labor. I want to zero in now on the transportation piece of this. Why have we not seen a shift in productivity and transportation here in this area the same way that we have with these devices, which we take for granted that Silicon Valley has fundamentally changed the typewriter, the telephone, TV as we know it, and of course, the library. And we've even begun to change transportation, but really only in a niche premium segment uh, for those of you who uh, drive a Tesla today, which I love the car, by the way, um, but it hasn't really revolutionized transportation as we know it. So we've got to go further. We actually were very innovative. This is a picture back in the early days of Silicon Valley where you can see most of this area was still orchards uh, and known for its fruits and nuts. Some might argue we still are known for fruits and nuts. Uh, but at that time, it was revolutionary. Abraham Lincoln's time, you, instead of taking a horse and buggy down the peninsula to get here from San Francisco, you could get down here in, fantastically, about exactly the same time it takes you now on Caltrain. <laughs> Very innovative technology at that time, not so much today. Um, and of course, today, it's not just this, but we actually live in a miniature form of hell. Our idea of transportation innovation is Oh, the commute's bad, so let's stick people in a bus and give them free Wi-Fi, because that'll make things better. 
By the way, I don't knock the employers that are doing this because, of course, it's really not their failing. It's a failing of the public infrastructure and a failing of our governments and our leaders to come together and really innovate the same way in our infrastructure that many of the tech companies are doing um, in the rest of their products. So most of you probably live some version of this um, and have seen that it's not getting better. It's, in fact, getting worse, despite the fact that we've started putting people into buses. So I want to ask a quick poll of how many miles do each of you think you drive on a typical day, on average? Um, so you should all have survey devices on your, on your lap. Here we go. There's a, looks like there's a few heavy drivers here of uh, 15 to 100 miles. Uh, but as you can see, a good number of you drive less than 15 miles. The national average actually is that you drive 12 miles per day. So it's actually not very far. You can see we have some heavy duty commuters here in the valley. Probably they're not on the 100 end of that spectrum, but on the 20, 30 miles. If you're coming down from San Francisco, that's about the distance. I highlight this because this isn't about going three, 400 miles and you know, what you typically hear about with range anxiety or impossible things where you have to take an airplane and you can't actually do surface transportation. The vast majority of our trips are actually quite short. So when you think about transportation solutions, we have a broad range of options. Before I get to those, though, let me talk about just how broken our current system really is. Because I came and the parking garage was full, so I'm pretty sure most of you came here by car. Yes? Uh, and for most of you, how often is your car actually in use? 4% of the time you're actually in it, but unfortunately nearly half that time you're either looking for parking or stuck in congestion. So you're getting about 2.5% use out of after your expensive home that Russ just talked about is your second biggest investment typically, unless you happen to own an airplane or a second vacation home somewhere. So think about that. A big investment that you make that you're getting 2.5% utilization out of. If this were your business and somebody said, I'm going to make an investment where we get 2% use, you'd be scratching your head going, that's crazy. It gets worse, though. Think about the gasoline you put in. Less than 1% of the energy that you're fueling in at the pump, thankfully a little bit cheaper now, is actually going to moving you. Two-thirds of it just evaporates into heat, which we have no use for here because we don't live in Minnesota. Uh, most of the rest of it goes into things that cost you money, friction, brake wear, tire wear, maintenance expenses. And the rest of it mostly goes towards moving steel around, not actually goes towards moving the 1.2 people that we have per car. So less than 1% energy. And if you, in case you thought that was bad, Let's think about the roads. It turns out if you do the math of how many cars are on the road, even with the rush hour periods included, and how much of the time we actually use those roads, because remember, there's lots of time at night when the roads are unutilized, you actually come up with half a percent utilization. Now, part of that is distribution, right? Because we all go to work at the same time. We send our kids to school at the same time. So we're all trying to use the roads in this narrow period of time. Most of the rest of the time, we're not. But even at rush hour, if you're not completely stuck with throughput dropped, you can only fit 2,000 cars per lane per hour through a freeway at maximum capacity. Because human beings need seven or eight car lengths to drive safely. I can't jam more cars on it, otherwise speeds drop. And lastly, our system is not very safe. We actually kill 33,000 people every year and cause $300 billion in economic damage from our road transport. If you're in the 25 to 40 year old bracket, this is your leading cause of death, much more than terrorism, much more than diseases, or any of the other things that get much more news attention. This is an epidemic that we haven't solved. And by the way, in case you think, oh, well, this is inevitable, airplane travel had the same statistics back in 1956. There was a crash over Long Island. We got serious about upgrading airplane travel. We built the FAA. We built air traffic control. We automated our planes. We have autopilots. We have extremely high qualifi qualifications for um, pilot training. And we got this down to a rate that if you adjust for the miles we fly, would be 800 people per year instead of 33,000 killed every year. So we can do this. So if you're depressed now, we get to the good part of the story, because there is an opportunity for Silicon Valley to apply the innovation magic and to get us away from this transportation system that is literally 99% waste. And it costs you about $2 per mile all in to go anywhere today, a dollar directly out of your pocket in terms of 
uh, maintenance expenses, fuel, but another dollar in terms of infrastructure upgrades. And I haven't even counted, there's a third dollar in terms of wasted time. So if it's really $3 per mile if you factor in the opportunity cost. I want to show you just how bad this is relative to the rest of our economic system. This is a chart that uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs has been building for 30 years now, basically showing the energy flow through the economy. And it shows two depressing facts. One is that we waste more energy up in the gray there than we actually put to productive use. The fact that this chart has gotten worse since the, the lab started doing this in the 70s, so we have, we're about 11 percentage points worse uh, than we were back then. The reason for that is very simple. Transportation. These are the percentages of how much energy goes to productive use through the three broad different streams. The middle one you can see industrial. About 80 percent of the energy through industrial actually gets to productive use. For electricity generation, because it's mostly still fossil fuel power plants, only a third actually goes to productive use. Most of the rest is pollution and heat. But transportation is the worst at 20 percent. And as an economy, we keep pumping more and more of our energy resources through transportation, so not surprising the aggregate number gets worse. So what's the plan? Well, there's lots of details that are specific to the region that we all need to work through and really solve. But I can tell you at a high level, it's these five things we need to get right. If we want to drive transportation productivity the same way that we've driven computing productivity, labor productivity, this is what we need to do. First, we need to think of it as an integrated network. Transportation systems are fundamentally networks. Right? We built a transcontinental railroad. We didn't build a railroad from Topeka to Denver and stop there. Wouldn't have been very useful. We also need to think by distance and multimodal. And importantly for the Bay Area, we're super fragmented into 38 jurisdictions. We need to think cross jurisdictions. None of you think, oh, I'm going to get a job only in my county, so I won't ever cross county lines. Right? And very few of us actually live and work in the same city. So it has to be a cross jurisdiction. It has to operate as a network. We need to think about this from a convenience, from a user experience point of view, the same way that we think about our iPhone and all of our other Silicon Valley products as this is a great user experience. People ought to love this. How many people love their commute? <laughs> Nobody, right? Because we, we sell you the car commercial with the car going in this beautiful landscape scenery that's off in Utah somewhere, and then you're actually stuck in Silicon Valley. So we need it to be an app, and we need it to be on demand, and we need it to be super convenient. We also need to think about sharing, because sharing is the biggest lever economically, as I'll show you in more detail in a moment, and is also the biggest lever in terms of resource productivity. We can do more with less if we share. And I'm not just talking about sharing the cars. Obviously, that's one lever. But you need to think about sharing the land. If I stack vertically, I can have retail on the ground floor, offices above that, and residential above that, or in any other combination that I want. I can also share between modes. If I have great street design, I can have pedestrians, bikes, and vehicles, and transit on the same set of roads. So think about sharing as sharing the infrastructure, not just sharing the vehicles. And by the way, the worst offender in terms of sharing today is parking. About 30 percent of all land in cities is devoted to parking and has no other use. Think about that. Right? We don't do anything with our parking spaces when we're not parking. By the way, even scarier, there are four parking spaces for every vehicle we own. So by definition, three of them are open at any point in time, and actually in reality more, because some of the times, that 2 percent of the time, remember, you are actually driving somewhere. Lastly, we need to think about frequency. Our metrics for designing transportation have been completely wrong. We focused on coverage. And you look at any transit authority, they're focused on coverage. What percentage of the population can reach transit? That is the wrong question. Because the fact that a transit vehicle comes somewhere near my house once an hour does not make it a viable option. If I wanted to go from here to San Francisco by bus, it would take five and a half hours. And more than half of that time is waiting time changing between vehicles because the intervals are so long. So we need frequent headways. We need convenience in the system. And lastly, of course, we need to innovate in how we pay for it, in the business models for who operates these systems, and ultimately the promise of autonomy that the vehicles can actually drive themselves, which I'll talk about in a moment, how that can have a good effect. But a good effect is actually not guaranteed for autonomy, depending on how we do it. Let's start from the very conventional. Most people will tell you, well, transportation works great, and transit works great if you have density. And that is true. These are two cities with the same population, Atlanta and Barcelona. 
Uh, and if anybody's ever been to Barcelona, you can certainly attest to the fact that Barcelona is not a worse place to live than Atlanta, right? You agree with me on that? And look at the footprint. Barcelona, much smaller. It's about one-fifth the transportation cost per resident in Barcelona. And you can see the carbon footprint is actually one-tenth in part because of that. So yes, density matters. But even in an area where we are with medium density, not low density, because that's Oklahoma and Kansas, right? Medium density, we can still do a lot. And I'll show you a picture of a little bit of history. This is the Peninsula Transportation Network at the turn of the last century. And notice, not only is there a Caltrain, but there's an electric railway that connects Cupertino to downtown San Jose, that connects Cupertino to Palo Alto. It was actually a network design, and it was electric. I bet most of you had no idea that that was the case. This is the only chart I could find of this, by the way. It seems to have been obliterated in most of our uh, libraries. Um, so how have we done today? Well, we are systematically creating our own destruction because we have put the jobs near the freeways and not actually near transit, not near our existing rail system. And we continue to separate land uses where we're growing our, our jobs all near the water and growing our housing, to the extent that we grow housing, as you saw from Russ's numbers, actually near the old rail lines. And here's the problem with that. Yes, it's good that it's at least one end of your journey is near transit. But if you have a choice of where to put your transit, it actually matters much more. I'm going to flip ahead to this page much more that you put it near your jobs, not near your housing. You can see here from this chart, if both residence and workplace are near housing, actually 40% typically do take transit, because then it's convenient. If neither is, not surprisingly, nobody takes transit. But in between, if you have a choice between either the job or your residence located near transit, it's actually the job that's more important. And if you think about this from a user perspective, it's obvious why. If you need your car to get from the end of transit to work, your car is stranded there. And the many other uses, taking your kids to soccer games, you know, going out to dinner, that you need around your home, you don't have your car. So yes, it doesn't work when you have a last mile gap to the workplace. Now I want to show you this picture. These are two Silicon Valley companies, broadly speaking. Uh, the, the right is Salesforce, the left is Cisco. And which of these two uses of land do you think has 70% more office space? Well, most of you probably guessed already. It's the Salesforce Tower, and as you can imagine, it's on a much smaller footprint. So if you locate that many jobs in one location, you can actually put it, this is literally right next to the new transit center being built in San Francisco. We could put a lot of jobs in your transit without any difficulty. And we don't have to go this high, obviously, but even just having uh, double or triple the height of the Cisco buildings in this uh, satellite image would make a huge difference. So that's thinking about transit. But actually, transportation is a problem by distance and by zone. And we need to think about our choices holistically, not just a single answer of the car or I need to build transit. It actually needs to be a multimodal, connected, online, on-demand system. For the inner circle, we need to have walkability. We need to think about pedestrians, and we need to think about bikes. We need to think about stacking shared uses into one building. And by the way, I'm not talking skyscrapers, right? This could be five stories in Palo Alto, where we have commercial on the bottom and, and residential and offices above that. And we need to think about sharing that infrastructure. In the mid-range, I'll show you data in a moment, bikes, and particularly now electric bikes, are actually the best solution. They are faster than getting around by car and a lot easier because there's no parking hassle. And ultimately, we need mobility as a service. We need shared autonomous vehicles that run around uh, as the improved form of taxis. And in the long range, we have a very short-term lever, which is actually improving our transit uh, and improving uh, Caltrain and BART in particular, and VTA. Um, but also the zoning lever, which I admit is a long-term lever, but we need to not continue to play our mutual assured destruction uh, up and down uh, the valley. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, starting with the, the red dot center here of the actual neighborhoods. First off, there's already a change of foot. This is the forecast for the number of vehicle miles traveled, and people are no longer traveling as many miles as they used to. The curve used to go in line with GDP and is now essentially flat. The reason for that is a demographic change. People under 40 
find cars to be an inconvenience. Their way of dating, their way of seeing movies, their way of uh, finding uh, friends is this, no longer the car, right? And because the younger population segment is much bigger than that older population segment on the right-hand side of this chart, the aggregate miles are dropping dramatically per capita. So change is already afoot, and younger people in particular like living in these kinds of neighborhoods. These are some of my favorite cities, all in a Mediterranean climate, but not California. They're all in Italy. They're all great to walk around in. Most of you have probably visited them and enjoyed your time there. They're a little bit taller than we build here, a couple more stories up. They do have mixed shared uses, and they have, in many cases, pedestrian zones in the, in the urban core so that you can actually have really high transportation efficiency and then you go out from there. They also interconnect all their cities with high-speed rail networks. Um, we've done a little bit of that here. Most of you probably recognize Santana Row. But the objection I typically get is, okay, so that works if it's not too busy. But if it's really busy, like the intersection of 101 and, and 85 maybe, or you know, 280 and 85, then this doesn't really work, right? We can't have these kind of neighborhoods there. Well, what's the busiest place in North America? Any of you came up with Times Square? Times Square has the most throughput in terms of people that cross it per hour. And what did Times Square do under Bloomberg? Well, it went pedestrian. It's now blocked off except for crosstown traffic. Now, obviously, commercial activity, revenue of the stores there, and pedestrian traffic increased. But what happened to car traffic cutting through crosstown at Times Square? Speeds went up by 20%. So there is a way to have pedestrians and vehicles coexist by not just jumbling them into one giant mess, but by creating clear pedestrian zones and then clear avenues for the cars to come through. And if any of you have been to New York, crosstown traffic is the, is the real pain point, not actually north-south traffic in the city. We can also do the same with our vehicles themselves. As you can see here from the pictures, the footprint of the same 40 people traveling by car versus by bus versus by bike, you can dramatically increase the sharing of the road space. And I put the little picture on the right-hand side just to show you how much parking space we could actually save um, if we move to these vehicles. So let me talk about bikes for a little bit, and I promised you I'd tell you why they're actually better than cars. But there's a catch. Our infrastructure doesn't look like Copenhagen on the left here. In Palo Alto, we put up a sign and we say, hey, this is a bike boulevard, and suddenly we think the problem is solved. I live on this bike boulevard, by the way, so I know there's two near accidents with, with honking and screeching every single day at the intersection half a block away from me because we don't really have real bike lanes. If, however, we went to bikes, and in particular electric bikes, watch what happens. The, the uh, lines here represent the amount of time required to travel these distances from one and a half miles to 10 miles. And let's just pick the 10 miles out. You can see that a car in perfect conditions, the way you see it in the car commercials, takes a car a little over 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes uh, to travel the 10 miles. However, in actual traffic that we have here in the Bay Area, and we did this as, a, as an actual pilot with Stanford uh, employees, it's actually on that middle line, the car plus parking plus traffic. So you need a couple minutes to find a parking space at the end, and you're not really driving in that, in that uh, Utah car commercial, you're driving in city traffic. So your, your actual time for the 10 miles triples to almost 30 minutes in, under real conditions. A regular bike, you can see it's reasonably competitive to three, four miles out. But beyond that, if you want to really ride a bike to work conventionally, you need spandex, you need to be a serious athlete. But if the bike is electric, you don't. Look at that electric bike line. It actually is faster than the car until five miles out, and it's neck to neck until about nine miles out when you start having a little bit of a disadvantage relative to cars. So think about having a nine mile radius of commuting by electric bike that you could actually do much healthier, much faster and more convenient, and look at the numbers here, much, much cheaper. And in that calculation, it's about $7,000 per year to operate a car. Um, it is about $800 and, you know, $900 essentially to own the bike. And we've assumed we're all California wimps. So every single rainy day, we're gonna take Uber. And you still come out ahead with about $3,000 versus $7,000 for the car. So think about that for your next commute. 
And I want to highlight that we have as many cars in the US as there are electric bikes in China. So we're way behind in terms of innovating in this area. We should all get an electric bike. I've ridden both of these models, and they're fantastic. They will thrill you, not just get you from A to B. We do get the fact that these dedicated bike lanes are safer, but the only place you find them in, in the Bay Area so far is in blocks that are absolutely crazy, where bikes are meant to go against the direction of the vehicle traffic. So then we put in one of these lanes. Why don't we do this everywhere if we already know that it's safer? So let me talk about sharing and on demand, because it's really this device that is fundamentally changing transportation. This is all the stuff you used to carry around. I used to be a management consultant, I traveled with all of this equipment to be able to ride trains and schedules and calendars, and of course, now there's an app for all of that. But how does this change transportation and the economics of transportation? I'm going to show you two examples, um, but first, I want to test your willingness to share. How long would you be willing to wait for a vehicle to come to pick you up that's shared? And forget for the moment whether it's an Uber or some sort of transit-like device, some sort of on-demand bus. Excellent. You behave like the rest of people, the other six billion people on the planet, which is the answer is you're willing to wait about seven minutes. OK. So we seem to agree. Very few people want to wait 30 minutes. You know, one minute, yes, there's a few really impatient folks among you, the type A. <laughs> but most of you give it a couple minutes because it takes that long to get out of, your, out of your door and into your garage, start up your car, and get going anyway. So why does it matter? Keep that in mind. Seven minutes is what you're willing to wait. Now let's talk about shared systems. One is vehicles. It's a pretty complicated chart, but what I've plotted here is on the horizontal axis, the number of miles you drive per year, and on the vertical axis, the annual cost of mobility for you as a total budget per year. And you can see that dashed line at the bottom, public transit, is always the cheapest, but it's only actually effective if you meet that seven-minute threshold, which I'll come back to on the next slide. But let's look at the other options. Owning a car is a big purchase or a big uh, annual commitment that you make in form of lease payments. Uh, and whether you lease or purchase, you can see the, the lines are almost horizontal because then on a per mile basis, you're really only adding fuel and a little bit of extra maintenance costs. You're basically paying for your, most of your mileage up front. But look at these new diagonal lines that have come in. I plotted UberX and Lyft line here as two examples, but you can do this with any shared car service. And what you see is, first of all, on the left-hand side, my upfront price, of course, drops. I don't have to buy anything. I buy per mile. The slope is steeper because, yes, per mile, Uber charges you more than you would pay for driving your own vehicle in terms of just gas and maintenance. But look at these crossover points. For a dedicated vehicle just for you being chauffeured by an Uber driver, if you're driving less than 5,000 miles per year, you have no economic reason to own a car. You may have brand and status reasons why you want your BMW or your Tesla. But economically, if you're driving less than 5,000 miles per year, it's actually much cheaper for you to sell your car and outright shift to Uber. And if I'm willing to share that vehicle, Uber Pool, Lyft Line, any other, any other bus option, that crossover point moves to about 10,000 miles per year. Now that is with 60% of the cost still paying for that driver in the car. Fast forward to an autonomous car where there is no driver, those mileage distances double. So now you're talking about 20,000 miles below which you shouldn't own a car which is now just about everybody. Because remember, as you said at the beginning of this talk, you drive somewhere between 15 and 100 miles per day, and that's mostly for your work days, I, I expect. Um, and so you're actually not driving more than 12,000 miles uh, per year. So economics massively favor sharing. Let's talk about the transit side of this. These are some of our transit systems plotted by um, a metric called Fairbox Recovery, which is how much of the actual cost of operating the system is generated by the fares, by the ticket sales. And I want to immediately bust a myth where we are still in the Detroit mindset here in Silicon Valley. We believe transit systems require public welfare, require subsidies, will never make a profit, and have to be heavily funded by taxpayers. Look at the two on the left here. And by the way, Korea, Japan, some parts of Europe would be the same. Fairbox recovery for Hong Kong, which if any of you have been to Hong Kong is an awesome transit system, very efficient, 
they're making 85% profit. Now, Hong Kong's a little bit denser than us, so I don't think we could get to 85% profit, but you get the point. You can actually run transit systems profitably. By the way, our two major longer distance systems, BART and Caltrain, are actually very good by North American standards. They're getting 80% or close to 80% fare box recovery. So they require very little subsidy. Our local system here in Silicon Valley, VTA, is not so good. Um, but on this metric, it's actually one of the worst in the country. Um, and it's partly because of the way we've designed it, which I'll come back to in a moment. But I want to highlight one thing that probably no one has ever told you. What's the fare box recovery rate of our, our highway system? Anybody want to venture a guess? I'm going to draw a little line for you here. So if you think transit is welfare and roads are free, have another look at the data. Turns out the fare box recovery rate for highways is in the mid-40s. Because remember, we're paying through it in the form of gas taxes, in the form of federal spending on roads and infrastructure, in the form of state spending on roads and infrastructure. So as you can see on this chart, BART and Caltrain are actually more productive transportation investments than our highway system. So shouldn't we be thinking about expanding all of the options, not just roads? And let me talk about that in a little bit more detail. You can see here um, the pattern of BART, and you can see how many people BART actually carries. And you can see the pattern down here in the Silicon Valley. And you can see we have much smaller ridership. I, again, I've not plotted the buses here, because bus ridership actually is tiny compared to uh, train ridership. Um, and also much less efficient, and very little uh, usage actually by the kind of audience we have here in the room. Buses are mostly ridden by people who can't afford a car, not actually by people doing it for convenience or speed. So you can see here, we've got pretty good coverage in terms of road network down here, but we don't actually have good coverage in terms of transit network. So not surprising that from 1915, when we did have a good network and a good coverage, we now actually don't have much transit ridership. I want to highlight something. This is our mindset, this is our choice. We don't behave like Detroit in any other domain, but in this domain, we still behave like Detroit, who thinks that public infrastructure and transit is just for the poor uh, and is just a form of welfare. It is not. It is infrastructure for the 21st century. It is what every other developed eco economy in the world actually invests in to make quality of life better, to make housing cheaper, to make commutes shorter. Caltrain has an offer on the table from a European railroad that is willing to operate additional trains with their own capital investment, actually paying Caltrain for the right to do so and making money. Think about that. An offer on the table to operate additional capacity to get us up and down the peninsula and into Silicon Valley from San Francisco with no money out on public taxpayers. Why aren't we doing this? I said, Frequency is really important, and you all voted that somewhere around seven minutes is the time you're willing to wait. Our system today, and this is why VTA is not working well, if you look at the intervals up there, and the, the, the little box is actually a blowout of the upper left of the main chart, you can see where we have three-minute intervals, like New York City, massive transit ridership, 55 60%. Where we have intervals of 15 to 20 minutes, people aren't willing to wait that long. And by the way, when intervals get to 40 minutes, it is no longer a business tool. Because if I miss one vehicle and have to wait 40 minutes, the entire rest of my schedule is now completely messed up. So I would never take transit if I need to get to a business meeting if the intervals aren't this short. And you can find places, Japan, the Shinkansen, the high-speed bullet train running across all of Japan is on a seven-minute interval. So you can literally show up not think about the schedule, get on the next train and go, and two hours later you're in a completely different city 400 miles away. I want to tell you a tale of two cities. Both of them have a large Chinese-speaking population. Both of them are home to major tech companies that ship globally. Both of them started working on their transit system uh, about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, one of them built a system with tracks, with stations that were about half a mile apart. One of them stations that are about a mile apart. You can see one of them built a lot more stations. One has headways of 15 minutes between trains. The other one has headways of two minutes and five seconds. I find it interesting that somebody would measure headway in seconds, actually. That tells you something about how they run their transit system. What do you think is the consequence? Well, on the left system, we have 30,000 riders per year. Per year. The right system has 9.3 million riders per day. 
Okay, who are these systems? The left one is here in Silicon Valley. The right one's in a small city that most of you have visited called Beijing. Why is Beijing able to do this? And by the way, for any of you who've been in Beijing, Beijing does not, at least historically when they started this, does not look like New York, right? Beijing looks like here with medium density. So we can do this in our tech capital, not just in China's tech capital. And I remind you, we had the beginnings of such a system 130 years ago. All right, my last point, and really setting the direction for where are we going with vehicles. I showed you this chart about how pathetic our transportation system is today when you think about uh, public roads and vehicles. The good news is we've got some great companies already beginning to tackle some of these problems. Google, as all of you know, and a bunch of startups is working on autonomous vehicles that will dramatically reduce these accidents. About 90% of accidents, a little bit more than 90, are caused by human error. If we can have autonomous systems that don't get distracted, that don't get on their cell phone, um, and that don't think about what's going on at work while they're driving, then we can actually reduce most of those accidents. We can also begin to integrate transit and routes into an app, uh, several other companies doing this besides Apple and Google, of course, um, to actually get an integrated multi-mode system that you can ride conveniently and have real-time information about where every vehicle is and when it's coming. I already talked about Tesla taking us electric and hopefully within the next two years into a mainstream um, mid-range, mid-price vehicle that we can all drive. And lastly, if we're willing to share, as I showed you earlier, we can change the economics dramatically because we can go from 2% utilization to somewhere around 50% utilization. And if we're willing to have those same vehicles do delivery at night, we can actually go to 70 or 80% utilization. That, by the way, is like the invention of the railroads, right? Because it's a 15-fold increase in productivity of our transportation assets, 15x. Not many places you can get a 15x increase. What I'm really excited about, though, is that these are not standalone innovations. These actually interact with each other in a positive way if we put them together. And why do I say that's important? Because if we just get autonomy, and you can now autonomously send your car to pick up a pack of gum or to pick up a bottle of milk at the store, imagine the traffic we will have if all our autonomous cars are driving around now with zero people in them on top of the cars we already have carrying people. If we start sharing them and make them electric, the benefits get better because autonomous and connected means I can actually change the spacing to about a meter and a half. Volvo and Mitsubishi have already tested this on roads in, in uh, Sweden and in Japan. And you get an eight-fold increase of every existing freeway lane. So without building more roads, 101 out here turns into a 32-lane superhighway if we go all autonomous and vehicles communicating with each other. Similarly, of course, if we share, the expensive cost of the battery goes away because your average trip is 15, 20 miles per day. You can have a car that has a 100-mile battery range that takes you to and from work, and then when you want to go to Tahoe or to LA and somewhere further away, you swap into a vehicle with a bigger battery. But you don't need to haul that heavy battery around, an expensive battery around, every day with you. I'm really excited about this because the combination is what I call ACES. Autonomous, connected, electrified, and shared. This is what we should be pushing for. And if Apple isn't doing this for Project Titan already, this is what they should be doing. And what are the economics of this? Eight cents per mile. And of course, you buy per mile in this system. And so you can now go eight cents per mile to a train. The train can take you to San Francisco in 20 minutes. You hop on a bike that might be an electric bike. You can go your last two or three miles. What an amazing experience, booked all on one app and available to anybody, the people who can't afford housing now will at least be able to afford transportation. And of course, the secret is, if you can afford transportation and transportation is convenient, you don't actually have to live in Silicon Valley to work in Silicon Valley. We can begin to have more housing options horizontally or vertically as well. So to recap a bit, integrated network, integrating multiple modes across jurisdiction, available on one app so that the data is open, and just not one app, but anybody's app, right? It should be in your Google app, it should be in your Apple app, it should be in uh, your Caltrain app, so that it's really convenient, it's paid for just the way that you pay for Uber today, where you never have to think about it after you once put in your credit card. Sharing both the vehicles and sharing the land, and importantly in the future, sharing the parking spaces. Frequency is really important. We need to change our metrics from coverage to frequency, because again, 
those shared vehicles actually provide the last mile access to even the transit infrastructure. So let's not have once an hour buses anymore. And we need to innovate in the business models as we're so good in any other domain. So a call to arms for us to reclaim our title, to be innovators, not just in technology, but actually also in transportation, making our lives better and leading the way for the world again, as we did 130 years ago and in the time of Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much.